What's going on guys? Welcome to NetTech Explained. And in this video, we're going to be talking about machine learning for security analysts. There's been a lot of buzz going on in the security community on machine learning. But for many of us, it's not fully understood what machine learning really is. And that's why, for the last year and a half, I've been working very closely with the DEF CON AI Village to bring an awareness of machine learning in security out of the buzzword and into the mainstream. Okay, so before we get started, I want you to imagine what you think of when you hear the words machine learning. There's no wrong answers, so once you have that image or definition in your head, I want you to focus on that for a minute. Now, the reason why I want you to focus on your own definition of machine learning first is because I want you to compare what you have in your mind now versus what we'll be covering in this video. Typically, when I do this exercise in person, people tend to fall into either one of two camps. They think you need a PhD in multivariable calculus and linear algebra just to get started, or they think machine learning is magic and Skynet's going to take over the world. Now, neither of those are true, but I'm going to put a little star next to this statement. While having a math background isn't specifically required, it will definitely help you out in understanding the more advanced machine learning concepts. And sometimes, I'm not going to lie, there is a little magic involved too. Oh, and there's one more thing to bring up here. Sometimes people tend to use AI, machine learning, and deep learning interchangeably, but that's not quite right. AI is this big umbrella term for different types of artificial intelligence, while machine learning is a subset of AI, meaning that there are many other forms of AI that are very different from machine learning. Likewise, deep learning is also a subset of machine learning. Deep learning specifically refers to deep neural networks, which include convolutional neural networks for image recognition and recurrent neural networks for cyclical pattern recognition. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's move on. If we had to define machine learning in all of this, here's how it would go. Machine learning is a set of statistical techniques that enables a process of information mining, pattern discovery, and drawing inferences from data. Machine learning algorithms learn from past data to predict future outcomes. And of course, this comes in a number of different forms. So here are just a few examples. We can use machine learning to help us identify botnet traffic by classifying dynamically generated domain names of previously unknown command and control servers. We can use anomaly detection to build smart web application firewalls that can not only detect known attacks, but obfuscated ones as well. And we can use time series analysis to predict trends in network traffic to help us identify potentially hidden network threats. Now, the real reason for this talk is because a number of these products already exist. In fact, as of today, over a quarter of security products for detection have some form of machine learning built in. So the challenge that security analysts are going to have to face is that to properly deploy and manage machine learning products effectively, you need to understand how they operate to ensure they're working efficiently. See, my goal is that I want to demystify machine learning and put it into the hands of our security analysts. And what better way to do that than to act like a data scientist and walk through the process of building and training our own machine learning models. Going through this, I want you to think about a case study. About a year ago, a friend of mine was approached by a nonprofit. And what this nonprofit does is they use cameras set up all over Africa to track cheetah population. Periodically, these cameras will take a picture and send the photo back to headquarters. From there, a room of human analysts look at the photos and determine whether a cheetah is in the picture or not. So what my friend did was he spent about a week using an already existing framework to classify images, and he built a simple model for this nonprofit. The machine learning model would look at the image presented to it and check to see if there was a cheetah. If it was over 5% confident that there was a cheetah in the picture, it would forward the image to an analyst. Anything less than 5%, just throw it away. Now, you're probably thinking, 5%, that's not a lot, that's a really dumb model. And you're right. But let me tell you what this organization was able to do. 
the amount of work they would have completed in one year, they were able to do in one month. That is a 1,200% increase in productivity just by applying a little machine learning into their process. That's amazing, right? So while we're walking through this, try to think of places where you could apply machine learning into your process. At a high level, we're going to do four things. Gather the data, build the model, train the model, and test the model. To go into a little more detail, gathering the data and preparing the data are going to be the steps where we will be spending most of our time. This is because we have to have clean, high-quality data to work with. From there, we need to choose a model that works best with the kind of data that we'll be working with and for our goals. Then, we'll train and test the model. Typically, we set aside 20 to 30% of our clean labeled data for testing, and the other 70 to 80% for training our model. This is called the training testing split. Think of it like the way we teach kids in elementary school. We want to use the bulk of our data to train the model. But then, how do we know if it'll perform well with data that it hasn't seen yet? Well, the labeled data that we've held on to, that's our answer key. We give it a test and see how well it performs. Pretty easy, right? Now, what if the model doesn't perform that well or we think that it could do better? This is where we start getting into hyperparameter tuning. Think of hyperparameters as little knobs and switches that allow us to make small configuration changes to the model and how it's trained. After that, we get our model to make some final predictions and then we're ready to deploy it in production. Even though these steps are listed out in order, this is really an iterative process, meaning we can continue walking through the steps over and over again to build better, smarter models using new data that we've collected over time. Okay, on to building our very own machine learning model. We're going to be building a spam filter because basic spam filters are very easy to understand, making them a great first example. Now, going forward, we're going to see some math and we're going to see some code. I don't want you to get too caught up in the details. You have the slides and you have the code, so you can play around with it on your own. Instead, for this video, I want you to focus on the process of how we go from raw emails to a working machine learning model. Also, to keep things simple, we're only going to be working with email bodies. No subject lines and no metadata. As a data scientist, the first thing we want to look at are our features. So, looking at this, how can we tell which sentences are about sports and which sentences are about not sports? The trick here is to look at keywords. For example, every sentence that references a game tends to be about sports, and every sentence that references an election tends to be about not sports. Since we're dealing with text data, one model that works very well is Naive Bayesian. It's based on feature, or in our case, word probability, and it works like this. Say we have the sentence, a very close game. Now, what we want to know is what is the probability that this sentence is talking about sports, given the words, a very close game. To find the answer, we plug it into this formula and we calculate the result. We'll do this for sports and not sports, and whichever has the highest end result is the winner. So how do we calculate each of these individual pieces? Well, we already know the probability of sports and the probability of not sports. We had three statements for sports and two for not. These are called our priors or prior probabilities. Now, what about a very close game and a very close game given sports? Well, we can break down the sentence into each of its individual words. Here, we can see it as the probabilities of a, very, close, and game. We then take this idea and apply it to our probabilities given sports independently. From here, it just becomes a simple counting game. How many times does the word a show up in sports? Twice. How many times does it show up in not sports? Once. How about very? Once in sports, zero in not. Close, once in not sports. And game, twice in sports, zero in not. Easy, right? Next, we just plug in our counts. We have 11 total words in sports, so each of the counts will be divided by 11 to get their probability. 
When we do the same for not sports, we'll divide their counts by the total number of words in that class. But wait, we already have a problem here. We've never come across the word close in sports before. So having zero divided by 11 gives us zero. And multiplying that by everything will also give us zero as our final result. That's not good. And here's another look at it when we plug it into our original formula. So how do we get around this? Because we want to predict on words that we haven't seen before, it doesn't make sense for us to use straight naive Bayesian. Instead, we're going to need to use a variant of naive Bayesian called multinomial naive Bayes. This variant applies a smoothing filter, which is just a fancy way of saying we add one to everything, so that we can't possibly hit zero on words that we haven't seen before. For the sake of completeness, here's the formula we'll be applying. As I mentioned earlier, if you don't understand what this formula is saying, don't worry about it. It's not really that important. What is important is knowing what numbers to plug in and where. This is the formula we'll be applying to each word independently. We have how many times that word shows up in the class, sports and not sports, plus some alpha, in our case it's just going to be one, divided by the total number of words in the class, plus the same alpha, times the total number of unique words across all classes. So let's take another look at our table. If we count the total number of words in each class, we'll get 11 for sports and 9 for not sports. Then if we count the total number of unique words across both classes, we'll get 14. Lastly, we can get the individual counts of each word in each class like we did earlier. Once we have our counts, we'll just plug them in like so to get their new probabilities. Finally, we plug those probabilities into each of our original formulas for sports and for not sports. And when we calculate everything out, we'll get 0 0.0000461 for sports and 0.0000 one, four, three for not sports, classifying this sentence, a very nice game, as being about sports. Whew. That was a lot of ground to cover. Usually it's at this point where people tend to have some questions. So if you don't quite understand what we just did, I encourage you to go back a little bit and rewatch that last section. You can also comment down below and I'll be able to answer any questions you have. Okay. Now, there are five things we needed to keep track of for Naive Bayes. What were they? We need to keep track of the total number of unique words across both classes, spam and not spam, or ham as it's otherwise known. We need to keep track of the total number of words in spam and the total number of words in ham. And then we need the count of each word in spam and each word in ham. That's it. Once we have all five of those, we're good to go. We're almost ready to move on to the code, but first there's still a few things we need to do before we can start counting words. Let's take a look at an example email. Before we start feeding raw emails into our model, we want to make them easier for our algorithm to digest. This is known as pre-processing. Here, we see a couple words like unsubscribe in both capital and lowercase. If we were looking at keywords, it doesn't really make sense to treat those words any differently. So the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is set every word to lowercase. That keeps them on the same level. Next, we wanna remove stop words like the, of, on, or, in, for. You get the idea. Stop words are found everywhere in the English language and don't add any context to a message. After that, we're going to apply a process called stemming. Stemming reduces words down to their root, making it easier to process similar words together. For example, the word congrats and congratulations mean the same thing in the English language, so it would be unfair to treat them any differently. Once we apply our pre-processing, here's what that exact same email will look like after the fact. Awesome. We covered the theory, we covered the process, and now we know how to work with our data. In the next video, we're going to take a look at how we can apply everything we just covered to build our own spam filter from scratch. In the meantime, that's all I have for you guys today. 
For more information, check out the links in the description below, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll see you next time.